has no uh, it's not a statement about you know whether things actually are out there or not out there. It, what it is saying uh, is that uh, whatever it is that we think it is out there, there you have it, you know, that statement, right? We think that it is out there or we think it is not out there. We think truly exists. We think do not truly exist, right? That, that piece, you know, we think, <laughs> we decide. And so already you are on a, uh, one step removed already when you are talking about do they truly exist, do they truly not exist? Even more basic than resolving do they truly exist, do they truly not exist is we think they truly exist or they truly not exist. So that which is cognizing, that which is um, experiencing that's the primary mm, determinant in the Zen tradition. This is called the host, mm, the host and the guest in certain forms of Chan or Zen. Mm, they talk about uh, not letting the guests, uh, not mistaking the guests as host. Like you have to occupy the position of the host and relate to the guests as guest. And you, the host, need to uh, carry the weight of being the host. Uh, so recognizing uh, mind, nature of mind, and recognizing uh, results, uh, consequences uh, of mind having gone out and then producing uh, and uh, producing and simultaneously experiencing everything else that we experience, that we see. So once we have that primarily as the way we understand, you know, like whatever we experience, whether we label, habitually label as pleasurable or painful, desirable or undesirable, it is so important that we never forget it's not a given. We are the ones that decide. We are the ones that habitually label this as this and that as that. It's one step removed already when we have to talk about, well, is this really this and is that really that? <laughs> That's already secondary to the main task at hand. The main task at hand is seeing the subjectivity of um, experience. So the Lojong in seven points tradition under the training in absolute bodhicitta, uh, because appearances uh, can be so powerful uh, and can so powerfully deceive us or we can be so powerfully deceived by appearances. So then the first prompt given in the meditation for absolute bodhicitta begins by having a C uh, the, uh, to adopt, at least you can think of it that way, whether it is or it is not again secondary, but to adopt the strategy of relating to all appearances, all experiences as like a dream unfolding. It's like being in a movie and so in doing that, then uh, appearances hold on us becomes less, less powerful so that we don't so easily get dragged around by appearances and our responses to appearances. So it begins with that. Then quickly, the second prompt is, uh, it says, examine or analyze or understand or see the birthless nature of awareness. So then now the subjective end of this pole, like subject and object is uh, the two ends of a pole, right? So the first is to uh, remove 
the stronghold that the objective end of the pole of experience has on us, then following closely behind is to release the fixation that is um, focused, uh, the fixation that comes from uh, holding on to the subjective end of this pole of experience. Uh, so that then subject and object ends of the poles are seen for what they are. And in that way, we become free. We become well, at least less uh, uh, terrorized by uh, experiences, by appearances. So this topic of, you know, like this mind, uh, this mind itself, that should be understood, that should be uh, observed. It's based on close observation that, that then understanding can arise. Understanding then leads to uh, stable realization and then realization that is to be further stabilized with habituation. So in a nutshell, you know, this is really what we're practicing. Uh, if we have to summarize everything, you know, like uh, what are we practicing? You know, we're basically practicing this. And then there's a lot of different methods, right? And then uh, a richness of the details of the different methods. But we should not lose sight of like, you know, um, when reduced to the bare bones, when looked at it from the most bare bones structural level, what is it that we are doing? we say we practice. This is what we are doing. So, yeah, how's everyone doing? <laughs> maybe we should chit chat a little bit. <laughs> and then maybe someone can do a calling Melissa from afar and see. She's back. <laughs> she's she's back. back. Oh, really? There I don't see her. Back. You don't see her? She's she's Hi, Melissa. <laughs> She says Maybe I'm on like speaker view. Ah, there she is. You're yeah. muted. No, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're good. still muted. Melissa, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you are. Yeah, we're small enough a group that we can unmute and uh, to chat. Yeah, I had to move to a different room in my apartment. Mm -hmm. I, I think this will be better. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah well, it's like is 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 it this weekend? This this particular particular room you're exploring or the landscape of the apartment. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I just you know I I have been um, having meetings in my front room, which is mm -hmm. more comfortable. But, um, you know, it's farther away. So. Anyway, <laughs> it goes in and out. It's not stable. Uh. <laughs> All conditioned states are unstable, so yes. <laughs> yeah, so how's everyone else doing? <laughs> oh, it seems so general. How's Jim doing? How's Mick doing? Yeah. <laughs> how's Cheryl doing? How's Casey doing? How's Betsy doing? How's Melissa doing? Oh, Melissa is moving from room to room. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, or rather, full professor Melissa. Yes. Ooh, yes. yes. fancy, fancy. <laughs> Here, let me show you a, a gift that I received from my parents. Uh-huh. On that note, just right behind my laptop. Can you oh. see? Oh, nice. oh. Yeah. <laughs> Tulips. <laughs> Tulips by mail. <laughs> Melissa's been dying fabrics. Where'd she go? <laughs> She's moving to another room. Moving around. <laughs> her down. We're on a it's trip. the weekend. She's going to places, you know? She's going places on the weekends. I had to re-plug in my laptop. So. Oh. I was saying, Melissa, that you're dying uh, fabrics. Yeah, and you with me. We're trying to make that eco printing thing happen. Oh. Uh, I, I just got uh, some uh, curtains for um, my studio, so to say. Ooh. Um, yeah, they, they look good when, when you, but when you, uh, if you see it through the camera, 
in the daytime, you don't see anything. It's completely washed out. Just these white panels. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the, the design, this is, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an Indian uh, woman in New York. I don't think city, maybe in the outskirts. But close to city is my sense. Um, and uh, she gets these fabric that are hand printed uh, from India and makes like, I, I first got a mask from her. Uh, mm. Then, uh, you know, vanity. I was like, I'm not going to wear some ugly mask. So I went looking and found an Etsy, like this nice blue and white print. And then when she sent the mask and then she had her link and I looked, I was like, ooh, and I found these, these um, hand printed curtains. Wow. Um, oh. Very nice. Yeah. We'll send Maybe, that a link. Sorry? <laughs> send us a link to her. Essay. Yeah. 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 She has some nice stuff and uh, I, I needed her to hem the, because uh, it's way longer than I need it to be for this particular window. So it took her a few more days to hem all of that. And it's, it's very nice material. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, of course. Um, and, and, and in fact, it is why I'm telling you all of this is like, it's inspired by your postings of these, you know, gorgeous fabric that <laughs> oh, good. like the, the, the rooster one. Oh my God. Oh yeah. Those Who did that ones. rooster one? Well, I don't know. It was a show that I, an exhibition of African textiles that I went to. Oh. That's all I know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, that rooster is like striking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got our little, um, what are they called? The, uh, Sunkor. We got them. Thank you. Oh, good. Now you can live dangerously. Is that what it is? <laughs> yes. Pass, passport to live dangerously. <laughs> so do we wear them? Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. Idea is to wear them, to have them with you when you're out and about and, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think if you're living during these times, you're living dangerously. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's always been dangerously. It's just the veil <laughs> is taken off, right? <laughs> A little bit more obvious. Yeah, it's just a little bit more obvious. Mm -hmm. I've I'll share. I've made a change in my daily routine. This oh, uh -huh. that I I've been putting off for I think years, really. <laughs> <clears throat> and the problem was that I'd get up and sit every morning and get some calm in my mind, and then eat breakfast, looking at a device, and get worked up over the news. <laughs> and just totally obliterate any merit that I'd achieved or any calm that I'd found. And so I just made a determination this week that I was going to eat at a table without devices and have coffee reading afterwards, reading some spiritual work or journaling and not look at the, not look at the news for a good bit. And uh, as you know, it, really has made a difference in my days. That's a major accomplishment. Uh, we can get so addicted to uh, being informed about the important things that is going on. That's, that's how innocently it comes in, you know? Mm, like we, because we care, you know? So we want to be informed. Um, but, uh, is it actually useful? <laughs> Doubtful. <laughs> but it's so addictive because, you know, it's, it's different from like some sort of like, you know, um, indulgence that is, you know, private and secret, you know, <laughs> like, like then, then there's a, at least a site that you're like, oh, you know, I shouldn't really be doing this, all these donuts here, you know. <laughs> but then if it is like, uh, if it is like, uh, right, like the state of the world, you know, the environment, you know, democracy at stake, right? It just feels like I'm, it's something righteous, you know? And that's even more pernicious, that hold on us, you know? Um, so I, yeah, I, for the most part, I don't, <laughs> I don't pay attention to news. Uh, I just feel like I already know everything I need to know. 
you know, when it comes to making decisions of this sort or that sort. Right? I, I don't need more. And it's, it's, it's just contamination is the word from the Sang offering tradition. You know, it's the way we expose ourselves to contamination uh, by <laughs> inviting in, you know, this, these contaminations. And they, they eat away at us. They, they just, you know, drain us, you know, this contamination. So congratulations. And <laughs> yeah, now you have to invest in like, you know, fancier coffee beans because, you know, you're not <laughs> giving more attention to it. You know, you're able to taste, you know, yeah. whether it's floral or citrusy or, you know. <laughs> well, you know, you're exactly right. And I, because I'm, now that I'm sitting, you know, at a table with my food and mm -hmm. ice, uh, it is a, you know, it's very similar to learning a new sitting practice. It is a new sitting practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, because my mind, you know, I have to train my mind to stay there. Right. And, um, yeah. And I like the challenge. Uh huh, uh huh. You know, I feel like, I mean, it's such a simple thing, but I feel like a newbie and um, right. I'm 68 years old and I'm a newbie. <laughs> Born again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I've been uh, uh, listening and uh, kind of feeling the, 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 the tactile sensation of uh, and and the hearing the grinding of coffee beans with Jim's hand grind there, Casey. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and it took me a while to you know COVID nineteen, right? What else is that to do? Okay, let's now <laughs> hand grind. You know. Oh, he loved that. He right. loved that. He loved that hand grinder. Yeah, he, I mean, dude, I would just watch him, and he would just. He was just so present with that. Yeah, there is a, you know, you, you, you pay attention. Uh, um, whether it's drinking tea, and of course in East Asia, there's a long tradition of that, whether it's drinking tea or drinking coffee, when you begin to pay attention to the whole process of how it gets finally into your lips and down your throat, um, it's a different experience, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's so that's so interesting you but i forgot that i gave that to you so thank you for mentioning mm -hmm. that that's really sweet um this friday is the two-year anniversary of jim passing uh -huh. but when you're talking about that i can really feel the um the kind of stillness and the sweetness of being that present Mm -hmm. You know, and like when um, Jim was talking about being sitting at the table without a device. Yeah. You know, I, and, and when you were talking about feeling guilty, I do feel a little guilty um, <laughs> about, you know, being okay and right. not right. really watching the news. I'm like, I can just check the weather and get quite a bit of news just from checking the weather because uh -huh. everything has yes. <laughs> information no matter where you go. You know, but I've been just, um, I have a few clients, um, therapy clients that I see, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I've been gardening and, uh -huh. and, and, you know, taking care of Kipo. And, yeah, yeah. And, oh, gardening. I mean, talk about like TP shortage. This yeah. is like, you know, like starters shortage. You have to like oh, practically yeah. fight people to get starters. Well, I, you know, I... I <laughs> <laughs> and I was really inspired when you were sharing, uh, I guess it was Thursday, the uh, yeah. Lojo. Uh -huh. about your friend that started the wild. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, I have 50 pots of starters now, ga gallon pots of starters that just got delivered this morning. I've been just starting some of my plants this year for the garden. Uh -huh. then I, so I went out, I was like, I'm going to get all my old flower seeds and go out and start some flowers. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that was so, so for those of you who didn't hear that, um, basically what's, what, what we do, are going to do, uh, one of our members, um, 
Bill Laity. Uh, he owns a landscaping business, so that's also the context. So, so he has lots of like seeds and plants. And uh, although he's a landscaping business, his his forte is actually um, less 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 like um, visual but uh, structural. So a lot of his his business is solving water drainage problems. You know, people's basements. Uh, well, I could use uh, his help. Right, right. And so he said, you know, he basically he said, you know, I have worked from now till I retire, you know, in this area in Asheville. Um, we've been seeing more rain and more rain. You know, Asheville is not officially a rainforest climate. And that's how much rain is getting over the years. And he said, you know, I, I'm guaranteed, a, you know, work to do from now till whenever I retire. Um, so anyway, so he he loves like wildflowers. So basically, he sprouted a um, hundred uh, pots, you know, this gallon pots of wildflower seeds. Uh, and so then he said, "Would you like some?" And somehow from there we went from there to like, "Hey, you want to make this a project?" He was like, "Yes, yeah, sure. What project?" So I said, "It will be like Operation Wildflowers." Um, so we'll have a couple of like distribution points. Uh, I'm in West Asheville. He's in East Asheville. Uh, so we're going to, he's going to continue to sprout them. And then we're going to just send the word out there to our neighbors, to the neighborhood and say, come by and pick up, um, you know, these pots of wildflowers. You just transfer them and plop them into wherever and then let them grow and then we're gonna you know have these popsicle sticks and uh, you know a little thing that says uh i came up with the word it is uh, uh well one side will say like you know urban dharma north carolina or a gift from urban dharma or whatever you know the other side it will say um uh kindness and beauty are also infectious yes <laughs> Well, that's so. I just love that. And when Jim and I turned our front yard, you know, into the uh -huh. garden, we just really had that whole intention of, of beauty because we just know how it calms, it just calms the nervous system. It's so inspiring and uplifting right. for everyone. Right. So I, I just felt really inspired about yeah. that again when you mentioned that. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> You know, it reminds me of a project that I knew about in grad school. I had a friend in grad school who did a, a similar thing. I was in grad school in Indiana, and he um, and he he did it with sunflower seeds, mm -hmm. in particular. And he went to Chicago to the neighborhoods that had no green. <laughs> mm -hmm. and he like recruited all these people to go and like sort of like a guerrilla planting mission. Yes, right, right, right. <laughs> so we're like Jim we've done we've done a new practice regimen and uh both of us are doing the triple excellence but we're in different places so we're not mm -hmm. doing the same thing and so we have not been for years practicing together mm -hmm. and um also getting up and reading the New York Times and the Washington Post every morning at breakfast and so we switched to it's been about i don't know a few weeks anyway um a song practice in the morning uh -huh. Uh -huh. and um it's one that pak chuck rinpoche uh -huh. teaches and um my brother george um he does it at home and when when i visited him he, i've done it with him he's been doing mm -hmm. it for 10 years mm -hmm. in the morning you make your cup of coffee you make the tea for the gurus and then you do this practice and uh, mm -hmm. we go out on the back porch and George gave us this little I forgot what it's called but it's the burner uh -huh. and he made uh, he made the incense himself from uh -huh. he's, a, he's a herb a herb guy or plant guy he's a rhododendron breeder and so forth anyway he made the, <laughs> the stuff and um, and so it's the we do it together. It's really, really sweet. And then, um, 
and then we can have breakfast and read the news. But, <laughs> but first we hand over, you know, and it's calling down all the blessings. It's offering up all the offerings and calling down all the blessings uh -huh. uh, on the universe. And it really um, helps me personally with the sort of feeling that this is bigger than me and I can't fix it. And, uh -huh. uh, and this feels like, well, it's bigger than me and I don't have to fix it. And uh, I just have to, you know, try to cultivate some faith. And, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, anyway, <laughs> it's been nice. That's good. Yeah. It's really been nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the, and Pak Chok ba, uh, uh, at his website, he offers a little class about this practice. Uh, uh huh where they teach you to do it and uh right so we're not just doing it blindly but it's really pretty it's really pretty. <laughs> anyway, it's, so it's a nice way to start the day too yeah and it, it and it really the thing is too about it is that it really for me personally it really kind of tightened up my discipline about my practice in general because mm. it sort of starts it you know starts the day and then so you really like you know, I'm in that trying to do a million mantras thing, and it seems mm -hmm. I think I'm at about twelve thousand or something mm. like that. <laughs> long way to go, but uh, so it's kind of daunting. But anyway, <laughs> and Nick has been gardening. I haven't. I haven't helped him except to go. Oh, look what you did! But he's <laughs> Oh yeah, look what you did. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it's a bummer because it's been raining a couple of days. Everybody mm. will testify to it. Not much blue sky, not much mm. big sky. And, and uh, so it's kind of dreary today. It's gonna to rain more. You're getting some of it too, I'm sure. Yeah. It's coming this way, yeah. Uh, You'll get it. So today, yesterday, and today is sunny. We At first, they were saying that it's going to rain. I, I guess it slowed down, probably hovering over you guys. Right, it's here. Yep. And but then, that's been the saving grace is the we've had a very pretty spring and beautiful mm -hmm. weather. And so we've been out walking constantly. Mm -hmm. Melissa turned us on to a really pretty trail that we went and saw, and it was really, really nice. Mm. <laughs> I went there the other day and it was it was like a perfect like Hawaii weather 75 degree overcast like <laughs> magical. it was amazing yeah really we told um you know Paul Carreras and his wife they went there because of our post about it and oh good it's gonna be a discovered place now but still really nice. yeah, all the riffraff is gonna go there now <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah. I say one thing I have to say is it's I and I've talked to Betsy about this too and I miss my grandchildren and that break that break is really really hard because mm. uh, their parents need our help and um, especially now you know mm -hmm. too. and we've been there for them you know a lot until now and so mm. just last week for the first time we saw them in person oh but we, we met uh, at a park one day and they had their bikes and we walked around the park we didn't touch or anything but and then we also went out to the farm my son former son-in-law has a farm and we went out there too and again staying at a distance and stuff but my granddaughter showed me her garden where she's really happy and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's but it's um it's troubling to me it's like I, they don't do zoom you know they don't do skype mm. they don't they're just kids they don't do that mm -hmm. so it's very hard to maintain the sort of intimacy mm -hmm. that we have and they're right at one of them is 12 and the other it will be 12 in, in june and the other one will be 10 in june and they need somebody to talk to about their mm -hmm. stuff and other than mom and dad how far are they? They're just about an hour away from here. It's uh -huh. 40 miles. Mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, their parents are wonderful parents, even mm -hmm. though they've been through a very bitter divorce, but they mm -hmm. are very good parents working hard to do good for them. 
Um, but these girls bounce back and forth between the two houses and uh, everything's unsettled for them and school is closed and blah, blah, blah. Mm. Right. 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 So mm. anyway, it's, it's a trouble. It's, we'll have to work it out. It just means we have to work harder. Um, Betsy and I mm. talk about this. We commiserate as grandmothers because she's got, <laughs> this, you know, she's got them too. But. I've got two that are in Illinois. <clears throat> I don't uh, know when I'll be able to see them. You know, it's right. going to be a while. You know, and, and the parents are home. And they've been home with the parents and they work from home. And so they're doing fine. But ugh, just months go by without me being able to see them. It's really hard. And just seeing them on, you know, on, we're used to seeing on screen. Because mm. we have Skype since they were babies. Mm. We, used to, we used to Skype when they, she would Skype when they were in the bathtub because they were captive audiences. Uh -huh. way back. But then I have the 11 year old here and he's been with me four days and four nights a week mm -hmm. for homeschooling for the last mm -hmm. nine weeks. And we have mm -hmm. one more week of that. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like starting to mourn that he's going to not be with me <laughs> all that much time, you know, it's kind of crazy because it's, it's been crazy parts of it, but you know, wonderful in many ways. So. Well, maybe after this week, he can homeschool you. you know? That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and we're doing this um, parent group on Saturday afternoons at three. Colleen and I are. At EBS, yeah. At EBS, EBS. It's, it's like mm -hmm. a parent's mindfulness group, you know. Mm -hmm. That's been really good. And yesterday I was like, oh, kind of, I oh, didn't, you know, I was like, it felt like a chore kind of, you know, to have to post it, you know. But it was great. And it felt like it was as good for me as it was for the, uh, the you know, there was just me and two parents and Colleen, there's four of us. We're all parents. I'm a grandparent. It was really good. It's really kind of becoming a um, little community. <laughs> good. So, so it's good. Yeah, it's really good. But I don't know. The transition of going from having Dylan a lot to not having him. I'm just anticipating that, I guess. And his mother's going to be home sometime soon. She's been in prison, so he's going to spend time with her. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just a lot of yeah transitions. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's good. I'm glad to be able to see him so much. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think, you know, mm, certainly there are lots of uh, uncertainties and all of that, but, you know, what to say. Uh. <laughs> I, use, I use your expression a lot. I'm sorry, what do you expect? <laughs> yes, right, right, right. <laughs> It's I'm sorry. <laughs> what to expect, right? Yeah, I mean, really, you know. Yeah. One of the things that I've been uh, kind of challenging myself with, and uh, you know, struggling with some, is um, you know, really trying to apply these teachings to my life in uh, situations and. One d difficult situation is when people are complaining about things in a way that I agree with them. You know, they're complaining about people not being careful. They're complaining about political things. And, and I feel, you know, there's this pull to, to join in and be upset and kind of bitch about it. And, uh, and I kind of, it's kind of like the news, I feel uh, it it infects me, and you know. Okay, how do I find? You know, uh, uh, it's such a struggle. There's such a social pull to join in, and uh, you know, how do I find this place besides just sitting there? Um, and and I find you know a resistance to coming. To myself at those times to coming inside. I guess I'm not alone in this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this takes us back to the kind of fundamentals of foundational issues of um, like taking refuge, you know. Mm. Uh, so if you translate, right, 
one 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 consequence of truly taking refuge is to say i i i now don't belong to any of the existing tribes including you know liberal progressive accepting blah 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 you leave behind those tribes you know <laughs> you know you join the tribe of bodhisattvas which may or may not you know uh have anything to do with you know democrats or you know <laughs> whatever you know to be able to say no actually we we don't agree on that and so i i i i'm not part of that tribe you know um i i've taken refuge you know i've joined the ranks of bodhisattvas um i i should be different and and without apologies without guilt you know like uh no i don't no i don't worry about that no i don't get worked up about that <laughs> and it's it's hard because it is about giving up you know the tribes that we have so comfortably identified with uh, so at a certain point in in the practice and the path um they say you know like uh actually friends and those that we agree with uh, uh, actually become a bigger obstacle than those that we don't agree with. <laughs> like in a way, you know, like uh, agreeable conditions are even more dangerous than disagreeable conditions, right? Because uh, agreeable conditions, you know, whether agreeable or disagreeable conditions, um, they are all chains, you know, whether it's iron chains or golden chains, they, they chain us. And it doesn't matter what, you know, you, whether you sink, you know, and drown with a golden anchor or an iron anchor, <laughs> a rusty iron anchor or a golden <laughs> anchor, you're still going to drown, you know, if, if we continue to be uh, tethered to uh, chains chains that eventually will be thrown into the ocean <laughs> so i think it really it, it really is sort of like almost the sense of like you know you you live in the world but you're not of the world right as, as the bible says you know, in the imagery of the lotus you know like you 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 are, you are rooted in the mud and the yuck you know and then parts of the muck and the yuck is better than other parts. But at the end of the day, you know, you're like, no, I, I, I blossom above this mud. Uh, so in that sense, right, uh, I think like at least at one point in the, say, like the Shambhala identity, you know, that, that, that I think that was what helped them to kind of like, you know, we're, we're not part of this, you know, we're not part of this hippie movement. We're not part of this. Of course, that then went some other direction where they're not part of anything. <laughs> you know, anything can kind of turn, right. you know, into poison. But, but at, at a, at, I think at some, a certain point in that development of that community, that was important and that was skillful, that was helpful, you know, like, no, we do not have TVs because... You know, they were way ahead, right? No, we do not have TVs because we're not part of that tribe, you know? Um, so I think this, this issue, you know, is, is important. Uh, we can remember, you know, like, where is refuge, you know? I, I even say, you know, like, don't, don't, don't even take refuge in Buddhism because Buddhism is it's something else, you know? Buddha Dharma Sangha is something else. You know, if you take refuge in Buddhism, then when people insult Buddhism, oh, you then you get all worked up. You need to, like, no, 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 Buddhism is not like this, da, 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 you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but then, you know, it doesn't have to translate to being like wishy washy, you know, oh, anything goes, you know. It's like, no, not everything, anything goes. I'm very clear about where I will go and where I won't go. <laughs> You know, but that clarity comes from you know, the objects of refuge, I think, being clear. You know, that there's a sense of a certain sense of pride about, you know, this is this is my tribe now, it's the Bodhisattva's tribe, you know. <laughs> it's not it's not all these other that kind of seems to, you know, coincide. 
but nonetheless isn't. Thank you. That's yeah. really helpful. And, uh, you know, my ego is kind of like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I hear that. And, uh, you know, my initial uh, kind of guess about how that plays out is really, you know, it's, it's, it's all an inner attitude you're talking about. Yeah. And in that, the manifestation of it will probably just be mostly my, my mouth shut more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I won't be telling people, oh, this is not my tribe. You know, this is my new tribe. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just at least mentally, you know, you're like, no, that's, I, I, I don't need, you know, I don't have a dog in that fight, you know. <laughs> you know, I always, I guess I've just so for so long felt like, oh, I, it was just, I never even questioned that I shouldn't have a dog in the political fight. Right, right. So this is a kind of like, oh, that's right. a new way of. Right. Okay. Because we don't want to feel like, you know, oh, wait, what does that mean then? Oh, it means, what does it mean that I don't care about other people? Does it mean that I don't care that other people are suffering? Does it mean like, you know, and then on top, right? You know, like, you know, I recognize my white privilege, da, 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 right? It triggers all those things, right? But really, from a Dharma perspective, yeah, those are maybe golden chains, but they are still chains. <laughs> and so then, then Bodhicitta vow gives us a way to care about others to really care about others. And we can all work on that because that's still a long ways to go. <laughs> and so if we really want to invest energy in truly caring for others, right? Either we buy what bodhicitta teachings are saying or we don't, right? If we buy what bodhicitta teachings are saying that the ultimate good that we can bring to others is first, we become Buddhists, and they become Buddhists. So if we buy that, right? If, I mean, either you, you, you agree or you don't agree, right? Mm. Now, now I say, okay, I agree. But between agreeing and, and then having my ego, my, you know, uh, stuff, bend its will towards that, that's a lot of work, you know? So if I want to get kind of not feel like I'm not doing anything. There's a lot to do there. I didn't, I don't need to be arguing with people about, you know, whether Trump made the right or the wrong decision because eh. <laughs> no. there's work to be done here. I don't have extra energy to do this. Does it mean I don't care? No, I care, but I'm going to channel my care in the direction of bodhicitta. I mean, what example, really honoring their really honoring their upset, right? And taking that in, yeah, yeah. and wishing for them some peace, right? Uh, I'll give like one example, you know, like it's just I maybe yesterday on, yeah, I, I was with my uh, god kids uh, and and their grandparents and uh, the other set, not not the set that just peaked. <laughs> to in the background <laughs> these are the neighbor god kids and then there's the farmer god kids and the grandparents uh, especially the grandmother is like you know she can't stop watching msnbc mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> she's just like getting all worked up all the time you know and i always say to her you know ah, just just give it a break you know you don't need that and her husband is a recently retired lutheran minister and uh, he's not he he, he doesn't you know, but she is, you know, she gets very worked up. Um, but I, yesterday, I think we were saying, I, I, I said something, I mean, I, you know, I don't mean to like turn everything into Dharma. Of course, I don't explicitly talk about Dharma. But then I said something like I said, you know, actually this wall, I, I guess someone was talking about the wall, you know, Trump's wall. And I'm, I'm like, then I was like, I said, you know, I could care less if she, he builds the wall. 
and of course, you know, people, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the grandma's like, what? Yeah. And I, and I said, you know why I said, and I never thought of it this way. And I go, yeah, it's stupid because it's a waste of money. He can go ahead and build his wall as far as I'm concerned, because you know what? He's not going to keep the people from coming in. That's the reality. So do build whatever stupid wall you want to build. Yeah. The people that I care about, at least in theory, are not going to let that wall stop them. And so it's a distraction to get all worked up, you know, about his stupid wall. <laughs> I'm like, build his stupid wall, you know? I don't care. Because I, I got, you know, like it hit me like, but it's not like I don't care about what I thought the impact of that wall is going to be, you know? But I also know, I think, maybe my understanding is wrong, that no, the wall is not going to do any damn thing except for, you know, a waste of money. <laughs> and, and, then, and then the grandma was like, oh, yeah, he's taking money away from the, 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 the defense department military. I was like, yay, I can celebrate that. <laughs> yeah, go build a stupid wall, you know. If you're going to take money away from the military, oh, I'm all for it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> it's not going to keep, you know. <laughs> and this is kind of like what I'm hearing in your tone is this, uh, you know, having a more, I mean, this is kind of a way of having a more playful, dreamlike attitude toward mm -hmm. our outer circumstances, not this rigid thing that I've bought into. So. Yeah, yeah, we become very locked into, and, and that's what it's all about, right? We can spend time studying systematically the two emptinesses, the two selflessnesses, selflessness of person, selflessness of phenomena, da, 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 and all that. Yes. And not get, right? Like, hey, let go. <laughs> you know, like take home lesson, you know, mm -hmm. dissolve all rigidity. <laughs> uh, but dissolve it in such a way that it's not becoming wishy-washy and no backbone, you know? No, you know, you're absolutely clear, but you are not rigid, you know? And that's what we can keep working on. So all this, you know, deity yoga, becoming Tara, becoming, you know, this, that, that. And if we don't get it, that what are we doing all of that for, <laughs> you know? Yes. Then that itself just becomes like a pastime, like a hobby, you know, like, oh, I do these things, you know, an hour a day. Uh, I accumulate, you know, 10,000 a day or 5,000 a day. Then it turns into, again, you know, in the context of the Lojong seven point, you know, it is not all converging in one point. It's like, you know, part of my identity is I do these things. I do these things. I do these things. Then it's not transformational. Uh, it's not actually changing us. You know, it just becomes another batch to, you know, and, and, and another batch to sew onto this uniform. And, 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 and then, you know, and, and, and then there's a particular tribe that wears this uniform with these badges, you see. <laughs> yeah, you know, it occurred to me that, you know, when we get in best like the wall, the symbology is what we are all yes. about. Yes. And the symbology of the news, you know, we sit down and we look at the concepts and then get all riled. Yeah. And the way we invest our energy into these belief and symbols, mm -hmm. if we could only channel a fraction of that into a deity practice or, mm -hmm. or yeah. whatever, you know, <laughs> would be so powerful. <laughs> but we're, yes. I'm really quick on, on like, ah, you know, look at what he did now, as opposed to like, 
Torah, you know, it's like, oh, this is like, how am I supposed to do this now? It's like, well, I know exactly how to <laughs> my my confidence or outrage or well belief or positivity. I just don't have any practice in it, you know. So, mm-hmm. but we're really good at <laughs> at visualizing <laughs> and uh, experts at it. You know, it's just the wrong it's sort of not a very good direction. Right, right. Yeah, we're visualizing other things, right? I mean, we're actualizing other things with, yeah. with our momentary thoughts. Yeah. Um, and habituating that, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's why, you know, like in this case, it's like, precisely because it feels just, you know, that's when it's even more addictive and dangerous. Because it feels just. And I know it's hard, I know it's because it's hard for me to think, you know, this way. But really, you know, we also have to afford this, this to like, you know, what we label as those crazies over there, they feel that it's just as well. You know, they're not that different from us in, in wanting to feel like what I'm doing is just, what I'm doing is good, you know. Uh, they, they similarly feel this is just, you know. <laughs> and, and, the, and the other side feels like a threat so that mm-hmm. uh, that's triggers us you know mm-hmm. yes yes threatened yeah oh yeah <laughs> yeah that reminds me i don't i don't remember how many years ago it was but our um there was a either a bill that was coming up or it got passed or something that was going to allow um discrimination, I, you know, LBGTQ mm-hmm. community here. And, um, you know, and it was one of those issues that really triggered me. Mm-hmm. And I've never was the kind of person that would go protest or do any of that kind of stuff. I went and I've never been political that way. Mm-hmm. But I felt really compelled because they were going to go down to the Capitol. Mm-hmm. And I felt really compelled. And I was like, what is this? I've never done this kind of thing. I'm too scaredy cat. <laughs> You know, I'm too much of a wimp. Um, but then also I was so triggered about the other. Yes. And I was like, I cannot um, go do this from a place of fear and upsetness. Right. I right. won't go if I'm in that place. So I spent, I don't know, several weeks just really sitting with that visceral feeling of, you know, so upsetness. I'm like, if I feel this strongly on my side, they feel just as strongly on their side. Yeah. So in that, we're the same, you know, and where is that meeting point and how can I get to that within my own being? Right. And um, just really sat with that and just really got to that feel and got to that point of this openness and not having that, um, you know, that contractedness and fear around it. And mm-hmm. I ended up, still feeling compelled to go yes. but there wasn't the fear there was this openness and it was so interesting because when i went i didn't know i mean all the people holding the signs were the people that you know would be the ones i would identify with right but there were the other people on the other side but i didn't know who they were and so i was able to just kind of every person i saw there was this open heartedness toward mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it was it, so it was such an interesting experience i can't i mean doesn't happen now I get triggered about all sorts of things but um but that what took a lot a lot of real digging and work and there was this visceral energetic I mean resistance to seeing the other side or being open to it because it felt so threatening yeah felt like I was going to be annihilated if I agreed with them or open to them or whatever so it was, it was tough to go there, yeah. you know? <laughs> I want to say the thing about uh, guru yoga and stuff like that is uh, that, well, or let me just ask it like this. Theoretically, or we're told we are Buddha, we have Buddha vision and heart already in us. And so when we practice, we're not manufacturing that. We're not, 
ginning it up. We're just connecting to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is what I've been trying to find in this whole pandemic is like looking around me at myself sometimes coming from that uh, place of openness and compassion and clarity, but also other people. And um, the response is like, for example, the fact that they're saying you can go back to work and no, every, everybody's going, no, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, you know, people have that in them mm -hmm. and we don't have to make them have it or tell them. But I do think that our, if we can connect with that and personify it or just make it real to ourselves, mm -hmm. that's contagious too. Uh -huh. It's like the fear and the and the battles and stuff. Uh -huh. So, uh, and I I see that you know. So so this week I wrote to my Congress people, uh -huh. and I just said, I didn't say you idiots, blah 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 blah, <laughs> right? I just said, please help the people of Arkansas. Yeah. Please spend money. Don't let people starve. Don't let businesses close forever because uh -huh. you wouldn't help them. Mm -hmm. Please help them. Mm -hmm. And it was just person to person. It wasn't even party to party. You know? right. Right. Of course, they won't do anything, but. Right. Right. <laughs> ah, who knows? <laughs> right. Yeah. Who knows? <clears throat> and there are a lot of signs of bodhicitta in action during mm -hmm. this pandemic. If you look mm -hmm. for them, they're all over the place. People helping each other, feeding their neighbors, you know, it's mm -hmm. just, it's great. It's a really good way to look mm -hmm. at it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I would say love and compassion in action. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bodhicitta needs the uh, wisdom element. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that is in short supply. That's what you said at the beginning, and you're right. That is yeah. what we have that yeah. puts us apart from. Right, right. Yeah, that is where we, we have to be different, not in an arrogant way. Right. Uh, the wisdom aspect that says, uh, sure, really good. We, we make sure that people are not hungry. Um, but the ultimate hunger is the hunger you know, for freedom from confusion. And that's the that's what makes the love and compassion turn into bodhicitta. Uh, I think uh, in in a more general, uh, I think especially in the West, uh, bodhicitta has sort of become interchangeable with uh, altruism. In fact, they even translate it as altruistic mind, which I use for a long time. But now, the more I understand, the more I see, you know these get a deeper understanding of the teachings. It's not being nitpicky even. It's the danger of forgetting, like we're not just generally, you know, compassion and, and kind, which is short supply as well, <laughs> for sure. But so important that that wisdom side um, is there. It needs to be there. So the three ingredients, so to say, for relative bodhicitta is love, compassion, and then wisdom. Uh, uh, increasingly, I said, you know, like uh, absolute bodhicitta foregrounds wisdom, uh, relative bodhicitta foregrounds love and compassion. Uh, but in each uh, aspect of bodhicitta, the other aspect is, is always there. Otherwise, it cannot be uh, bodhicitta. So, and when we recognize that, you know, it's very powerful. It's also very liberating and say that, uh, yeah, I, I don't need a dog in that fight because that's ultimately not the fight that I have committed to, mm -hmm. you know, even if in the short term, it looks like it's worth fighting that fight, you know, <laughs> and then to whatever degree you can fight that fight, without losing the bigger fight, yeah, sure, you know. But often it's at the risk of losing and forgetting, you know, the fight that we should have a dog in, <laughs> so to say. <laughs> I really like Casey's story. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's an example of what you're talking about, and I can relate times in my life, <clears throat> you know, when I've been able to kind of look at the other side. And, and so when I take the action that I would have thought before would have been the right thing to do, I have it, I'm doing it with a different attitude. Mm-hmm. And it, it's not such a fight. It's just what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then it was kind of like, I don't know really why I'm doing <laughs> this, but there's some impetus to do it, but there's right. not, yeah, like, there's not that, you know, stickiness or grip around it. Mm-hmm. It's the respecting the impetus that I'm curious about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To me, that's it- just like this movement of, you know, whether it's the movement of the wisdom and compassion together, or it's just this this movement, you know, that is so interesting how that can happen. You know, whatever our own inclination may be. Mm-hmm. You know, that that I that I still felt moved to go because I thought, oh well, you know, okay. then I won't have to go. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because what's the point? <laughs> it's like, no, I still showed up. I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't know why? <laughs> the point is to turn up and to turn up for all the right reasons, right? So to say, to turn up. Mm. Um, and, you know, bodhisattvas, the Diamond Sutra says, bodhisattvas turn up, so to say, mm. knowing that there is no being in an essential sense to be liberated. And, and the Bodhisattva's definition is the one that tirelessly works to liberate others to the point of even uh, being willing to give up the chance of being liberated him or herself so that others can be liberated. Mm-hmm. But while knowing Absolutely, there isn't any being in an absolute sense that is being freed. <laughs> so the impetus, you know, elsewhere I have said, right, if we look up carefully and deeply into this matter, uh, but the Shakyamuni and Hitler uh, were driven by the same impetus. One became Buddha Shakyamuni, one, one, one became Hitler, you know? Uh, and that's, you know, wanting happiness and not wanting suffering, right? Mm. And that comes from Buddha nature. Buddha nature is comfortable with happiness. Buddha nature doesn't know what to do with suffering. <laughs> so the worst and the best persons that we can think of and everyone in between driven by the same thing and, and in, in more general terms, his Holiness the Dalai Lama in his public talks, he says, you know, all of us want to be happy without any exception. There is nobody who says, I don't want to be happy. Yeah. Even those whom we say, you know, but yeah, you continuously, you know, you are happiest when you're miserable. Well, because that's their definition. That's their understanding of how to be happy. Nonetheless, you know, they are searching for happiness with no exception. And, and that's, my teacher says, you know, like if you, you don't need to get into all this philosophizing and quoting scripture and everything to show that, you know, innately we're Buddha. He says, the evidence is very clear. Uh, never ever can you have afflictive emotions and you feel good. <laughs> you only feel good, you know, when you're experiencing love, compassion, generosity, you know, it feels really very, very relaxed, you know, very good, (laughs) very natural, right? So it's natural to you. The opposite is not natural, you know, it's just stressful. (laughs) Now, then based on that impetus, then so important, again, back to the wisdom point, you know, where, where it is lacking for those who end up creating suffering for themselves and others and creating it so powerfully for themselves and others is lacking wisdom. 
even though motivated by the same impetus. So whether it's Shakyamuni or Hitler, you know, same impetus. The offering of the pigeon goddess girl. <laughs> My what chapter is that? Chapter eight. Uh, it's almost like now we just randomly open and see which chapter. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, so I, uh, so let's look at this. Uh, Namo Guru. Jasimilarepa left Yomo and journeyed to Tibet, according to the prophecy. So Marpa, you know, said certain things to him, where he will go, where he will stay. So this is part of Marpa's uh, prophecy. In a cave in Kutang, while alone like a rhinoceros, residing in a state of luminosity, there came a pigeon wearing a dangling gold earring. Here's another image, Mick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know. They don't have ears, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's the interesting part. part. <laughs> Pigeon with wearing a dangling gold earring. As though prostrating, the pigeon bowed her body and nodded her head as she circumambulated Milarepa many times. Then she flew in the direction of Immaculate Rock. Knowing that this was the invitation of a spirit, the Jitsun went over to her. There sat a pile of white rice, which the pigeon began offering to him with her beak. As before, she prostrated and circumambulated and then flew away. The Jitsun, with great joy and amazement, sang the song of realization. Emaho, Marpa of Lodra, who has been so kind. By remembering you from my heart, I meditate with you there. Again and again, I supplicate you to never be separate from me. Mixing one's mind with the gurus is so blissful. So much of dharma and dharma practice is completely impersonal. In fact, it's telling you not to personalize anything. Don't take it personally, right? It's a very cool and remove kind of uh, style, right? Dharma practice. And so I think it's within that context that then there's this outpouring of devotion, almost like a, a, a balancing factor uh, that on the one hand, you do need to approach Dharma practice in a very impersonal way, uh, seeing how it's causes and conditions, uh, accumulating, arriving, coming together, then going away. And so there's so much of Dharma practice is to depersonalize, right? to, to, to deconstruct right? all these meanings and attachments and value. And right? so much of that is going on. Uh, so then, you know, I think, uh, I, I think this is my personal opinion, the people who want to do secular Buddhism, they take that. Then they have left out, right? This other side, kind of like, because that side can go too far. So it's being balanced with, you know, these kind of uh, devotion that Milarepa is expressing at the beginning, you know? Mixing one's own mind with the gurus is so blissful. Uh, by remembering you from my heart, I meditate with you there. Uh, and uh, if, you know, we say, oh, devotion, I don't know what it is. And uh, that's because, you know, I don't think you can really talk about it. <laughs> You, can, you can't really write a treatise about devotion <laughs> and try to explain devotion. <laughs> Alala, the nature of appearances is pointed out as birthless dharmakaya. So this is very uh, profound, you know, instructions. 
Uh, appearances means, right, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. Uh, what our senses experience, all of that is appearances. Uh, the nature of appearances is pointed out, uh, has been introduced to us, has been shown to us uh, to be the birthless Dharmakaya. And they merge. And they merge uncontrived with the state of Dharmakaya. So what merges is appearances. And they merge appearances and Dharmakaya, uncontrived with the state of Dharmakaya. I'm not concerned whether some views are high and others low. This uncontrived mind is so blissful indeed. The broader context is, in Buddhist seminaries, in Buddhist philosophical schools, in the shedras, determination of which view is superior to which view, which level of the Buddhist teachings is superior to which level, this, this, this enterprise, this concern, is kind of at the heart of Buddhist seminaries and Buddhist uh, philosophical uh, academies, uh, all these kempos and geishas, uh, which are highly revered within the tradition as like the, the you know, like the, mm, mm, the, the, the princes of the church, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, really in Tibet, you know, knowledge is highly valued. Yeah? In Tibet, to call someone a scholar is not to denigrate them. <laughs> um, it's, it's really valued, you know. But it's within that context, within that background, that Milarepa says, you know, I'm not concerned whether some views are high and others are low. And why? Because he has already seen the uncontrived mind. He has seen the nature of appearances to be the Dharmakaya, to be the mind. So he has, no new, he has no need for these views anymore. After all, the purpose of all these views, right? These philosophical positions, these articulations of what is these fingers that are pointing to the moon, he doesn't need them anymore. So he's unconcerned, you know? He's, it's, it's like... So even with this, you know, like it, it's sort of like at Milarepa's level, he doesn't even need the Buddhist tribe. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, 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 you, you guys can go debate that. You know, you, you guys still have a dog in that fight. Go ahead, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm unconcerned about that. And does he not care? Uh, you could say, well, do you not care uh, that... Uh, um, that uh, using words in a sloppy way will cause other people to not see the truth or misunderstand the truth and will be lost on the path. You could accuse him of that. You could worry that he is not thinking of that. But in his own mind, he knows. I care about sentient beings. And so same as what we're saying, you know, what do you mean he can build his wall? <laughs> well, you could be feeling that for many reasons, right? There are wrong reasons to feel that I don't care if he builds his wall. He's not keeping me out. I'm already in. Well, obviously, that's a wrong <laughs> reason to not care about whether he's building his wall, you know? So even with something so important, which is very important yeah, to be able to be clear about this level of the view uh, is preliminary to this level of the view, which itself, you know, is secondary to this level of the view. And so, you know, in the academies, yeah, in the Buddhist academy, in the philosophical schools of training, that's like mostly what they're training, you know, kind of like refining their understanding and learning all the necessary vocabulary and expression and quotations from sutras, so that they can become guides to others. But Milarepa has seen directly 
what the nature of the mind and the nature of phenomena is. And he says, I, I don't need this, all these other things. I don't. You can think whatever you want to think about me. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and certainly there were those who say, you know, like, ah, what is this, you know, uneducated wandering yogi? No, you know, never even went to, you know, Buddhist school 101 for a day. And why are you people following him? So it was quite scandalous, you know, when Gampopa came to him. You know, I'm sure Gampopa's colleagues, you know, uh, learned monks and all of that, you know, like, why, why are you going to this guy? <laughs> he doesn't even know what the sutras say. Oh, 88, this nature of mind is luminosity, emptiness. Empty and yet knows, knowing and yet empty. Yeah? Luminosity hyphen emptiness, uh, meaning mind, the nature of mind. Yeah? Mind in its nature, in its essence. Yeah? It's not something that you can point to something you can fixate, something that you can, you know, identify. Therefore, we say emptiness. But it is not a mere absence. Therefore, we say luminosity. That luminosity emptiness is pointed out as awareness. That luminosity emptiness uh, applies as well to this couch, right? to this prayer wheel, right? to this bowl. But that luminosity and emptiness, when applied to an individual, then it's the awareness. It's the knowing mind that, that each of us have. And they merge in the uncontrived innate state. They is awareness on the one hand and the qualities of luminosity emptiness. And so he says, I'm not concerned over good or bad meditation. This uncontrived mind is so blissful indeed. And so this is the, the, the three, uh, the rubric of view meditation conduct, a very common one, which Milarepa uses a lot in all of his songs. So in, so in, in regards to the matter of view, right, he says, once you understand appearances are dharmakaya, then you don't need all the other views, the high views, the low views, you know. And then once you understand nature of mind is luminosity, emptiness, then, uh, you know, this meditation, that meditation, meditation done this way, done that way. That's a good session. That's a bad session. It doesn't matter, he, he says now. The uncontrived mind is so blissful indeed. That's a refrain that occurs again and again. Uh, but basically now, uh, as for this mind, as for this awareness, as for this knowing, it is always luminous and empty, empty and luminous. The sixfold collection, clear right in its own place, is pointed out as non-dual, free of perceiver and perceived. The sixfold collection is talking about sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and thought, six senses. So the sixfold collection is clear. It's, it's vividly clear, right? Experiences, what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, what we touch, what we think of, they are clear right in their own places. And this is pointed out as non-dual, free of perceiver and perceived, and both pleasure and pain are merged into one. With this body uncontrived in its primordial state, I'm not concerned over right or wrong conduct. 
And so view, meditation, and conduct. So he, when he says, I'm not concerned over right or wrong conduct, it's not saying that he now uh, doesn't pay attention to conventional understanding of you know, uh, morality and ethics. He's not saying that. But he's saying like, you know, once, once I understand, you know, uh, the nature of appearances uh, as a projection of my own mind, then uh, virtue and non-virtue is very clear. And from that place of clarity, even if I tried, right, I'm not capable of creating suffering with my actions. It's not saying... Now, when I kill, there are no consequences. Now, when I steal, there are no consequences. But what he is saying is, even if I wanted to, in a way you could say, I'm not capable of killing or harming. And in that way, he's no longer concerned about right or wrong conduct. Then the fourth, the fruition is the nature of Dharmakaya. The variety is pointed out as Nirmanakaya. Everything when encountered is merged with the state of liberation. But I have no hope of any fruition. This uncontrived mind is so blissful indeed. This refrain again. So if the fruition, if the result of practicing view, meditation and conduct is dharmakaya itself. And from that dharmakaya, when causes and conditions come together, it emerges as nirmanakaya, meaning Buddhas that appear for the benefit of others. Then in fact, everything, when encountered, can be experienced as such. Like they say, everything becomes an aspect or everything becomes your teacher pointing you towards the reality state. Then at that point, you know, you don't even need to long for result, long for fruition. I have no hope of any fruition. Then it says the pigeon comes back with seven other pigeons. <laughs> they prostrated and circumambulated. Milarepa. Milarepa says, these are certainly spirits. They're not just ordinary pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, they, they reveal themselves, you know, these goddesses. Uh, these are his non-human disciples. <laughs> Yeah, anyways. View, meditation, conduct, and fruition. By the way, these are, I believe, carefully crafted um, songs after the fact. <laughs> Editorial hands, you know. Um, I think all all poets, you know, like uh, not just in the modern time, who have published things will tell you, right? A lot of word smithing and word crafting is involved. Um, reason I say this is I've we've been looking at I'm, I've been working on translations of like some teachings, uh, short, short teachings of the founder of Drigong Kagyu who lived in the 12th century. And uh, the translators that I'm working with, and they, they say, you know, oh, you know, we're more used to translating these later compositions 
that you know um, there's a particular clear logic yeah, in which they present their material like this you know it's carefully arranged view meditation conduct fruition but in this earlier material uh, you never know where they're going <laughs> So in a way, it's harder to read them, but in a way, it's also kind of uh, refreshing. Yeah. But uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, my why I say you know like we should recognize that you know these have been edited uh, and uh, kind of cleaned up so that they become very clear. I think it's important to see that you know. Uh, because sometimes when we look at this and we look at ourselves and you're like, you know, I'm, uh, my understanding is just so fuzzy, you know. It's like, well, maybe it's not as fuzzy, you know. You have to recognize the, the uh, skillfully contrived nature of these spontaneous songs. <laughs> and not get too discouraged by, you know, well, I don't come up with songs like this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Questions or <laughs> this particular song sang to the pigeon goddess. Can I ask you a really silly question, kind of? <laughs> well, how would you translate a maho? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's an expression that does not literally have the meaning of wonderful. It's a different word for wonderful, but it's like an, an expression of joy and wonder. So it has no meaning. Yeah. No. Sort of like saying, aha. Mm -hmm. Like, does aha have a meaning? No. But aha, if you want to explain to someone who doesn't know this expression, you would say to that person, it means like, oh, I get it, you know? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And so it doesn't have uh, meaning. But the occasions when you say that is when, when you want to express joy and wonder. But joy and wonder, even that, right, in a dharma context so in other words you know it would be really weird if 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 you were writing it writing in tibetan and you go emma ho because you want to say oh it's wonderful a little bit weird <laughs> i had an emma ho day yeah. a bit a little weird for yeah. tibetans <laughs> But it's an exclamation that expresses joy and wonderment. Thank you. Yeah. Emma. You know, um, I can think of a Spanish uh, equivalent. Uh huh. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard anyone say "ijuale." Mm -mm. Ijuale is like um, "emajo." It's like huh. one, one time I asked a native speaker what "ijuale" means, and he got uh -huh. really frustrated. He's like, "Well, I, you know, he, he, there's no translation. It's just like, aha, <laughs> yeah." <laughs> Right, right, right. 
I really hear in this, uh, you know, teachings that, um, you know, apply directly to our, our conversations earlier today mm -hmm. about, um, you know, I guess in your words, in this tribe and right. in the Buddhist tribe, what's important is, is view and meditation and with that, right action just happens. Yes, right. We don't yeah. need to, that, that focusing on the actions before really having these views is putting the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in the sense of like, you don't have to contrive the actions. Um, I want to share with you before we leave a quote that uh, it was uh, uh, May 5th in some countries, uh, but it's yesterday in some other countries like uh, Central America, it's like Teacher's Day, mm -hmm. like school teacher, you know, like, I don't know, growing up in Malaysia, we celebrated that, you know. Mm -hmm. I think increasingly in America, it seems like nobody really pays any attention to Teacher's Day. But anyway, you know, like in the group that we have on WhatsApp, you know, people, especially the Central Americans, they're like, happy Teacher's Day. Thank you so much. Da, 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 da. Then it reminded me of um, this short teaching by uh, uh, Jigden Sumgan. Uh, the title of this short excerpt that I'm going to read to you is it says, um, the, it's the title is, The Excellence of a Teacher Depends on the Students. <laughs> yes. It's so wonderful, you know. He says, uh, The precious guru, meaning Jigden Sumgun, because this is the disciple recording, yeah, what Jigden Sumgun taught. He says, The precious guru said, that one clearly can know the good and bad qualities of a teacher based on observing the teacher's students. Since the success of a teacher depends on the student's attainment of realizations or qualities, there is no greater service to the teacher than reaching the attainment yourself. If that does not happen, though a teacher proudly thinks, I am great and good, and there's no one better than me. If the students turn out useless, people will ask, did somebody kidnap his students? Or did some spirit possess his students? There is no greater way to disgrace the teacher than this. Then he goes on, he says, just as one knows the quality of one's meditation by looking at one's mind during the post-meditation period, one knows if a teacher has qualities or not through the arising or non-arising of qualities in the disciples. Therefore, as the worldly saying goes, the good and bad of a student reveals the innards of their teacher. <laughs> In this regard, the precious guru once said, whether I am clairvoyant or not depends on you, Sherab Jungne. <laughs> his disciple, his closest disciple, also his nephew. He says, whether I'm clairvoyant or not actually depends on you, Sherab Jungne. When asked what he meant by that, our guru said, if you become a genuine practitioner who benefits sentient beings, everyone will exclaim, oh, this guru is indeed clairvoyant. He knew that Sherab Jungne would become great, and so he sent for him all the way from eastern Tibet. 
if you do not turn out benefiting beings, they will say harshly, even though this guru had his nephew sent all the way from Eastern Tibet, nothing came of him. Not only is this guru lacking in clairvoyance, he does not even have a basic sense of judgment. <laughs> Harsh. <laughs> but he cuts right to the point, you know. He cuts right to the point. Uh, uh, he says, you know, and, and, and it's both ways. I mean, it can be read almost, I mean, you, I think it's a mistake to read it as, you know, it's up to you guys, mm -hmm. not me. Mm -hmm. But it's also emphasizing like, well, what, if, if you want a definition of a good teacher, then you have to do the things to nurture them. And then, of course, pressure is also put on the students. Now you better not disgrace your teacher, so to say. Yeah. Right? Both sides right, needs to be so committed to the goal of this relationship to start with. Yeah. And if it turns into something else, then, then it's not it's no longer this teacher-student question. You know? It's something else. You know? But if we keep it to that, then... The only way you can, you know, say this is a good teacher is you have to look at what are the results. <laughs> is there any good, you know? So, so I've said in the past, I say, you know, we know Marpa is great because we have Milareva. <laughs> yeah, one Marpa, I mean, one Milareva is enough to demonstrate that Marpa was a great teacher. Uh, in a different, slightly different context, you know, there would be no Jesus if there wasn't Paul. <laughs> Paul, who was responsible for more than a third of the New Testament. <laughs> Although they said that Paul never met the human Jesus. So, <laughs> so uh, Guru Yoga, I suppose. <laughs> whether you meet or don't meet the teacher, if you know how to practice guru yoga, you can be guided. He was, he was in the cloud, right? Yes, he was in the cloud, right? Cloud. <laughs> That's how they put it too. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, anyway, you know, that's uh, Jiktan Simgun's response. <laughs> I thought that was good, you know. It's like, if you don't produce any realizations, you know, then they will say, you know, clairvoyant? Mm -hmm. Forget about clairvoyant, you know? He's not even a good judge of, like, you know, people's potentials. Forget about being clairvoyant. <laughs> so it's really good. It's like, you know, whether I'm clairvoyant or not depends on you. <laughs> I love that because it points out that, you know, interdependent relationship. Yes. Exactly. It's interdependence. Yeah. Uh, so the teacher, you know, has to be committed to, uh, you know, like the welfare of the student as a student, you know, not, not, not the welfare of the student as a father, as a, you know, like, that, because there's so many, right? context to any given person so in the context of you know the teacher and the student then the nature of that connection needs to be clear now of course now we're talking about you know dharma a guru figure i mean guru in the right vajrayana sense guru figure then yeah really you know if we want to uh really uh, show that you know our teacher is great so to say you know then we have to take responsibility for proving that yeah. by their fruits you shall know them mm. 
So if we want to say Buddha Shakyamuni was great, then we who claim to be his tribe, <laughs> we have to prove that with our realizations. If we say, oh, the Dharma is so good, the Dharma is so good. Well, the, it's, it's, we need to prove that, you know. We can't just scream and yell that the Dharma is great. So you know what? The uh, 12 step people are going to kick us out. Anyway. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Good. Uh, okay. You all have a good rest of Sunday. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, <we'll>... Tata. Tata. <laughs> Thank you. Tata. <laughs> All right.